All right. Is it okay if we start? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Scott Moser, um, and this is Serge Hallen. We work for Canonical um, on the Ubuntu server team. Um, Canonical is the team that, or the company that funds Ubuntu development and development of lots of other technologies. Um, this session is um, using containers without risking your as. Um, if you're looking for something else, then you can step out. Um, <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just as a forward, we'll go ahead and I'll give a quick introduction to um, containers. And then Serge is going to take over and talk more about the in, in depth on containers and um, and specifically user namespaces. And then I'll give a demo like experience for user namespaces. Um, and then we will have some time at the end for some questions. Um, so. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with what a container or the idea of a Linux container is, um, or at least have a vague idea. Um, it says popularized by Docker or Parallels or LXC. Um, generally, it is the ability to run multiple operating systems on the same system, or multiple Linux-based operating systems inside of the same system and get isolation and confinement on those. Um, essentially, you can think of it like Lots of times it's described as CH root on steroids or BSD jails or Solaris zones. One way or another, you're probably familiar with the technology. Um, from, from inside the containers, from inside the container, the system generally looks like a, like a full system. And from outside the container, it generally looks like just a bunch of processes to Linux. Um, and but there is no single set of Linux container. Um, there's no, the kernel doesn't really know what a container is. Um, it's a f user space fiction built on a bunch of different uh, Linux kernel facilities. Um, if I've not confused you enough, then I'll hand over the phone to Serge. Uh, okay, so the different kernel features that you can use to make up containers have been coming over time into the kernel. Um, the first one, arguably, was actually the uh, mount namespaces that uh, Alvaro introduced in the year 2000. Um, before that, when you, when you did a mount, there was a single global mount namespace. Uh, and any time you mounted something, all processes saw the same thing. Uh, what this did was each task had its own mount namespace. And normally when you clone the task, the new task would get a reference to the parent's namespace. But you could request, is this, um, am I moving it too much or is it? Uh, right. um, if you asked for a clone UNS in the, during a clone operation, it would give you a copy of the mount namespace. Um, and there were no... There was no on system call at the time, and there were no uh, mount propagation. So from that point on, any mount done in the one task would not be seen by the other task, and vice versa. Uh, and the idea was to kind of do what Plan 9 does, uh, where unprivileged users can all manipulate their own mount namespace. Um, there's two problems there um, resulting from the fact that Linux is different from Plan 9. One is just the fact that in Plan 9, everything is a file, and so you could you can start a new task and you can bind mount a file into place to, from another host to uh, forward all your traffic to the other host or to change your display. Uh, you can't do that in Linux anyway. Uh, but the other problem is that in Linux we have this thing called set UID and we have root super user privilege. Um, and so in plan nine, you could manipulate your namespaces and do what you want. And then if you want to, say, become a different user, you talk to a factotum service that still has its own clean context, and it does the uh, authorization for you. Whereas in Linux, you run, say, su, uh, some set UID with binary, which is going to check uh, Etsy shadow for your password to, to validate it. Well, if you can change your mount namespace and then bind mount your own file over Etsy shadow, that's going to completely um, corrupt the uh, authentication there. Um, so that, was, that is one thing that is actually solved by user namespaces. 
uh, eventually, as we'll see in a bit. Um, so that showed up in the year 2000. Um, the first thing that looked like a container that you could do upstream was in 2006. Um, and that was the PID namespace. So first, there were a couple teams um, from OpenVZ and IBM that all worked together to get container stuff upstream. And they had different reasons for doing so. OpenVZ, of course, wanted containers. Uh, the team I was with at IBM, we want a checkpoint restart. And so all we wanted was to, if you have two tasks that are an application and one is waiting on the other one, it does that using the process ID. But if you checkpoint it, kill it, and restart it, the process ID may have already been used by another task. And so you want to be able to, you want to, be able to guarantee that that process ID will be available. And so we did this with a dirty hack, a, a virtual PID. Um, and Alan Cox came, I think it was Alan Cox, came back with a suggestion that the mount namespaces was actually a very good analogy to use for what we wanted with process IDs. Uh, and so then in 2006, we came up to quickly push the, the namespace proxy, the UTS namespace, and the PID namespace, and other namespaces followed. So what, an, an, what a namespace is, when we talk about kernel namespaces, anytime you ask the kernel to do something for you, you pass it some identifier that you have a, uh, to your handle in user space, and you say act on it, and then the kernel will translate, translate that to some kernel resource that it acts on. For instance, a path name, or a file descriptor, or a, or a PID. Um, and so when, when, when we namespace something, like the process IDs, that means that when you create a new task, you can have a clean namespace or a clone of a namespace where your identifiers will refer to different objects than for another uh, task. Um, so you can see that that can be used to an extent for isolation in that if I create a task, manipulate this mount uh, with a clean mount namespace and manipulate its mount namespace so that it does not have a path leading to the host's Etsy shadow, then that container in theory cannot read or write to the host as the shadow. Um, so you can try to get some security guarantees out of that. The problem is that Linux is a very Baroque thing with lots of ways to do things. Uh, and so some examples here, um, you, you may create a container with a fresh mount namespace that doesn't have access to Etsy shadow, but if you don't have a fresh PID namespace too, then you can sit and wait for a host process to log in or change its password, and then you can actually access Etsy shadow through its proc, uh, PID, FD, and the file descriptor number. Uh, so by itself, namespaces, they're necessary, but they're certainly not sufficient for trying to get some security. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do things similar to this. If you, if you clone only the PID namespace, you can actually still signal tasks in some cases by writing the files that will trigger a kill to a certain task. Um, so the, the, the next feature used in, um, the next feature used for containers is uh, control groups, which showed up in 2007. And what they do is they, they, they group tasks together, and then on those groups, you can uh, account to resource usage, you limit resource usage. Uh, and there's some special C group types, like the devices C group, that lets you do, uh, let, let you say this group cannot, um, access device dev SDC1, but it can, uh, it can access other devices. Uh, so you can see where that, that can be useful for constraining a container. Um, but again, without a user namespace uh, and without other ways of limiting it, you can have root, it, since root, without a user namespace, root in the container is root on the host, and if it can remount uh, the C group file system, which you use to control file systems, it can simply move itself back into a control group where it isn't constrained the way you want it. Um, another thing that's very commonly used in containers, or was very commonly used in containers, is the capabilities bounding set, which is introduced in 2008. And what that does is, so the, the root super user privileges are broken down into pieces, like the ability to manipulate the network, the ability to Right to, to own to, to use files that aren't your own, as if you own them. Um, and so you can take those pieces and you can say this task and all its children from now on will not be able to use that privilege, um, which can be useful. Uh, but there's a few problems with it. Um, the first one is that these capabilities are rather they're coarse; they're not fine-grained. And so anything useful you want to take away from root in a container also takes away other useful things that would be safe for it to use. Um, 
Another problem is that root in the container or being root on the host still means it doesn't need any capabilities to access any root owned files on the host because it owns the files. Uh, so it doesn't, if, if it can get access to a host owned root file, it can do what it wants with it. Um, and then due to simply the way that capabilities are broken up, um, there's a paper here that describes how with just this one or two capabilities, you can get all the other capabilities back. Um, so again, by themselves, the bounding set was not sufficient. Um, and so then I, I'm going to generally skip this slide. It just goes over how LSMs and SecCom could also be used to further the security. So the crux of the problem is that without a user namespace, root in a container is root on the host. Um, and so there's almost inevitably always ways for it to find some foothold back onto the host where it can then say, I'm root, and it can get out of the container. Um, and for a long time, the answer was, wait for user namespaces, they will solve this. Uh, now, actually, the first user namespace patch was introduced in 2007. Uh, yeah, 2007. Uh, but all it did was, it, it gave you separate accounting for, different, for the same user ID in multiple namespaces. Uh, but it didn't provide any isolation or any security guarantees. So if, if you had a file owned by user ID 1000, then user ID 1000 in any user, user namespace owned that file. So you couldn't, you couldn't segregate the containers that way. Um, so we, we, we worked for, you know, we spent a lot of years and did a lot of prototypes trying to find a clean way to actually provide the isolation. And finally, in, according to my get tree, in December 2012, the first version of the final design of user namespaces was accepted. Okay, so the, de the, the design criteria were these. First off, the same user ID in multiple namespaces <coughs> must be completely segregated. <coughs> a file owned by user ID 500 in one container must not be owned by user ID 500 in another container. Um, and likewise, it should, if, if, if it should find ac access to a process ID of user ID 500 in another container, it shouldn't be able to kill it. They should be completely separate. Um, root in a container must be able to, must be privileged over the container. It has to be able to kill tasks by belonging to other user IDs. It has to be able to configure its network um, and all that stuff that we normally associate with root on the host. But at the same time, it must not have any privilege outside of the container. Um, <coughs> so the, the goal there is that root in a container basically needs to be the same thing as an unprivileged user on the host. And that allows us to let containers be safe for use by unprivileged users so that they don't need any root privilege at all to crea create or run a container. Uh, and then lastly, we want them to be nestable. So if you, you create a user namespace underneath the initial user namespace, <coughs> we want to be able to create another user namespace under there, which has the same isolation guarantees from the parent namespace as it had from the initial one. Okay, so the, the, the design in the end is as follows. Um, user IDs in the kernel are now known as kernel UIDs, KUIDs, and they are distinct from what's in user space. And any time that user space tries to talk, uh, make a request to the kernel, the user ID that user space passes gets translated from its namespace into the kernel. And when you first boot your machine, uh, you have a translation <coughs> one to one for the full range from zero to minus one um, from KUIDs to UIDs on the host. And then as you create a new user namespace, you can take ranges from the parent namespaces uh, range and map those into your user ID. Um, and if, any, if, if anything shows up like a file owned by a uh, a user ID that isn't mapped into your namespace, it'll show up as being user ID minus one, and your access to it is as if you were just user other. So if, if, if it's got world read permissions, you'll be allowed to read it, otherwise you won't. Now the unprivileged user, um, 
if a non-privileged user can create a new user namespace, and by default, he can only take, he can take any a user ID in that new user namespace and map it to his user ID on the host. So if I'm user ID 1000, I can either leave nothing mapped in, or I can map user ID 0 in the container to user ID 1000. So that then when I look at the file ownership, it's owned by user ID 1000 on the host, but user ID 0 in my container. Um, now, of course, to create containers, we want to be able to do more than one user ID. And the next slide will show how that's done. Um, but the last thing then is that uh, all other namespace types, like the process ID namespace and the mount namespace, are owned by a user namespace. And so when you first clone your new user namespace, your network namespace hasn't changed. <laughs> so it is still owned by the initial user namespace. So you can't configure your networking. But after you've, unclo after you've cloned your user namespace, you can clone a new network namespace, which is empty, and now you can configure that because your namespace, your user namespace owns that. So that's how we solve the mount namespace problem because anything that you'll have privilege over is something that you owned anyway as user ID 1000 on the host. Yeah. So the last thing is for, um, like I say, user ID 1000 by default can only map user ID 1000 in his namespace to a new namespace. So uh, the administrator on the host can delegate sub UIDs, just a portion of UIDs from the host, and say this user may use these sub UIDs. And then by keeping those segregated, he can keep containers from affecting each other or affecting the host. Uh, the allocate, this, is, this part is done through the shadow package, the sh shadow um, tree. Um, an Etsy sub UID and Etsy sub GID are the files where the allocations are stored. And you can just use the user mod program to grant or revoke allo sub UID allocations. Um, and they just get written to those two files. Now, you still, as the unprivileged user, can't take user ID 100,000, for instance, and map it, and map it into your new user namespace. But you use two set UID with programs called new UID map and new GID map, which will look at the allocations and say, yes, he's allowed to use uh, 100,000. And then it'll do the write to a proc file for you to uh, assign that user ID into your namespace. Uh, so that way, each unprivileged user can be delegated sets of sub UIDs and sub GIDs to use in their containers. They're kept uh, separate. Uh, as sanely as possible by user mod. So when you create a new user, it'll automatically find an unused range to assign to users. Um, and that's it for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll take over and do a somewhat of a demo. Um, these are just canned screenshots and things that I've made, but actually walked through all of this on um, an Ubuntu 14.10 instance. Um, so running the set 3.6.16 kernel. Um, generally the setup is the, the host in the next slides is, the, is named lxc-host. Um, there's two users on the system, Elsa and Anna. And um, each, are, each of them are configured to run user space uh, unprivileged containers. Um, there's two programs that I basically used in the slides. One is called MyWait. It does nothing but um, basically touches a file and then sleeps and it prints out its PID, its UID, and you know, so you can identify who he thinks he is. Um, and then show info is just some front ends to PS and different things so you can see better off. Um, yeah, so here this is, this is the host or I'll go over, the things that are highlighted here are the host. Um, there, you can see that spin init is, the one that's highlighted there is owned by GID0 and, it, and root and PID1. Um, and then you can also see that in that, in that section up there, each of the, uh, the highlighted uh, user NS, that's the inode number of the uh, of the user namespace. So that's indicating those four processes there are in the host's user namespace. Um, and the rest of them are not. Um, here you can see, so there Elsa is running my weight. 
and she's got PID 13109, and Anna is running my weight and has PID 11, 1182. Um, yeah, okay, you wanna go to the next, next slide. So here now, this is the setup of the LXC, of how we set up LXC on the system. As Serge talked about, there's Etsy sub UID and Etsy sub GID, and those files are configured to give Anna and Elsa, um, I gave them a million, a million uh, UIDs and GIDs each. Um, generally in Linux, most Linux has come with uh, the user nobody that has a GID and UID of 65, 534. Um, and so if you don't map, somehow you basically have to account for that or your nobody user is not gonna work. Um, so you can either map a range and say when you create a container, I want to map zero to 1200 and then also map 65, 535 to a different bid or you can just deal with it and um, you know, start containers each with like with 65,000 PIDs. The one trade off of doing that is PIDs, I meant UIDs. The issue with doing that is that the UID is an int 32 so you have only 65, 5,000, 65, 535 if you hand them out at 65, 535 each. So um, it's a limited space there. Um, so back, back up here, um, the container there. Oh, yeah, so, and then the, um, the config for Ana C1 is configured to have, you, you know, up there it shows the u user ID of 2 million and the next 65, 535. Um, and then here, down here, we've got Elsa and Anna are each running the MyWeight program. And, you know, their PIDs are shown. Um, let's see, so here, here is focused on Anna's first container. So Anna is running two containers. Um, and one is, you know, is dash C1 and her S bin in it is believes inside the container that it's bid let's see where I'm lost um, oh I'm sorry so Anna's my weight program is bid 592 and then if you look on the but from the outside the container the the host sees that as bid 12 177 and then the user and the user ownership that you see there of two million on each. And then the init PID, which as general init thinks it's PID one, um, is PID 6900 from when viewed from the outside. Um, and then up in the top, that the show info files is showing the file that it touched. So the file permissions from the host are seen as two million and GID two million. Go ahead. So this is um, on a second container. The only th the only thing to point out here is that if you compare its init to its to her C1 init, they have different UIDs because it was mapped a different a different range. So her second one started at 2100 or 2 million 100 thousand, and the first one started at 2 million. So you can see the files are differently owned than than the first containers and the ownership and the you know, the processes are running as a different user also. Go ahead. Um, so this is, and then this is Elsa, Elsa's C1 host, and the difference here is that I ran, instead of running as root, running my way as root, I changed user inside the container to um, Ubuntu user, which is PID 1000, I think, or UID 1000 inside there, and ran the my way. So inside, he thinks he's ID 1000 and GID 1000. But if we look at the process outside, you see that's three, uh, three million, one thousand. Am I saying, yeah, three million, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, but then you can also notice that it, the user inside there is different from root inside there. So the init process is, is running as three million and the, the Ubuntu process is running as three million, one hundred thousand, or one thousand. Um, so generally, yeah, and then the user in S identifies those, and there's the range that we're given. Yeah. 
Um, so this is just Elsa's, Elsa's second container generally. Um, and then showing the, her processes there in the same way. Um, generally, the thing to notice is that um, inside the container, the the users the user IDs are you know not zero. Um, so to point out to make that so inside, I believe I'm zero, but outside the kernel actually sees me as being um, you know three million one hundred thousand there, and. The key, the key thing in there is that if you break out of that container, if, if somehow Elsa escaped from this container, um, or this process escaped from the container, they're just PID 3,100,000, UID 3,100,000 on the host. So even if they were to get out and have access to the host file system, they can only read files that are world readable. Um, the, and and then even outside, they're no closer to becoming either Elsa at UID 1002 than they are to becoming Anna or reading Anna's files. So just the user namespace provides you with pretty much the level of security that you're used to on a multi-user system. All right, so we're generally functional, or generally accepting of running multi-user systems where each user is not privileged to see other user's files and we trust the kernel to not allow me to kill your files, your, your processes, and vice versa. So essentially, this is exactly that. Each of these containers is no more privileged than a multi-user system, or in the same idea. OK. Um, so, how, yeah, so how safe is this? Essentially, for you know, some time, we've been running the you know, there's been a lot of work in past decade or whatever to make basically to stop running processes as root, right? Um, and so generally, it's considered best practice to not run processes as root if you don't have to. Um, and user namespaces and Linux containers allow you to actually to do that and to have each process with a, a finer granularity. Um, and inside of that container, root inside the container is um, just an unprivileged user on the host. And that's an important thing to notice. And however, it, it is a user on the host. And so um, you basically then inside that container, you have a local user, right? And the kernel, uh, the Linux kernel has plenty of CVEs. They come out, there are, there are known exploits against the Linux kernel. They, you know, your distribution does their best job to patch those and get you the the kernel updates as quickly as they can, but in in 2014 there have been 101 CVEs and 14 of them local privilege uh, escalation um, could be used for local privilege escalation, not necessarily shown, but um, I guess. And so, if you're doing this, if you're running uh, containers and you have users in those containers, you need to be definitely aware of CVEs um, and address those, up, take your updates from your kernel. And also notice, and a lot of times you'll see comparisons between, you, people will say, what is the difference between security of a container and a KVM? Um, definitely, you need to be aware of CVEs at all points in time and address your kernel in both situations. And I just pointed out that some of the exploits would have affected KVM also. So there, there is no silver bullet per se for security, but be aware of your CVEs and apply fixes. So this is, and then here I tried to put together um, how you can use this, how you can use uh, namespaces, or user namespaces, and how you can best run <coughs> Linux uh, containers. Um, Basically, 3.8, if you've got a, a Linux 3.8 kernel, but realistically, I think that's 3.10 is what you should say is the minimal to be running uh, to do containers, uh, user namespace containers. Um, if basically any of the, the distros listed there, if you're using the current version, or the current, in Ubuntu's case, 14.04 LTS, um, if you're using the current one, you should have support in your kernel for user namespaces but you won't have it in, in minus one. So 
I mean, Red Hat has it in seven, but not in six, to my knowledge. Um, and the same thing is true of 12.04 on Ubuntu. And then the tools that can take advantage of this, um, if you've got LXC 1.0 and there's some improvements in 1.1, then you can you can use their namespaces there. Libvirt does, Libvirt has support for running user namespaces. And actually in Juno, the Nova Libvirt LXC driver got the ability to use user namespaces. Um, you can look at the documentation for that. Um, and then Nova Compute Flex is the, uh, is a uh, a project we've been working on at Canonical to take advantage of LXC more directly than through Libvirt and um, and by default it, we're we're doing that with user namespaces. So each container would be running as a, in the user namespaces rather than running as a uh, privileged user. Um, and then I I understand that Parallels is on their roadmap for early 2015. I'm sure that. Okay, I got a nod that that's correct, so. Okay, so um, I, these are, this is, this is generally what we have. Um, the slides are available there at that URL. Um, you get, you're welcome to email myself or Serge Allen um, and, or ping us on IRC. There's a, the credentials there, or the uh, name. Um, there's also several different uh, articles I listed there, three different articles that are really good reads um, if you want to learn more about user namespaces or about containers in general. Um, actually, in, ge in general, the, the, LW the LWN articles there are, are fabulous. LWN does a wonderful job about writing kernel information. So That's what I have. If um, we, we can you have some time now to take some questions if there are any. Okay. The uh, files in XCD we're looking at are SE, subuid, and subgid. What exactly reads those? Are they, do those just populate kernel tables or are they specific to one of the tools you're using? Uh, yeah, those are used by the subuid root programs, new UID map and new GID map. And so <clears throat> the way you actually, what to actually create and populate a user namespace, you, you do, you do a clone or a unshare of username space, and then proc self UID map and GID map are the files that you write to, and you, you write the, I, I, I forget the order, because I don't usually use it as the files, but it's the, I think the namespace first UID, the parent namespace first UID, and then the number of UIDs you want to allocate. Um, and so root can do that with any values that are valid in its namespace. You can only do it with your user ID, but so new UID map and new GID map do that on your behalf, subject to the Etsy files. Well, all other namespaces are owned by a user namespace. Yeah. Right. Okay, but if, but processes within that user namespace then would not be able to modify the host network namespace because they are now on privilege from the perspective of the host. Right. And so in the kernel code itself, what used to be just a call, a call to capable capnet admin was changed to a NS capable, and then it, the network arrow user NS comma net capnet admin. And so it checks for capnet admin relative to the network namespace, uh, the user namespace to which the device belongs. Right. And I guess, I'm not sure you ever want to, but I guess that means it is not possible to create something in a user namespace that is able to modify the host network configuration. Right. Okay. And so in, in container managers, what you have to do is provide some way for admins to delegate. So like in LXC, there's a file at C LXC slash LXC usernet, which says this user can create on this bridge so many network interfaces. And so the admin has to carefully decide what bridge is that safe on. Like you don't want to do that on a bridge with E0 because then they can redirect traffic. But yes? What if I'm running a, a workload which for some reason needs, for instance, direct access to the network hardware via kernel? Is that, is that you can, yeah, the, well, the root in the, in the, on the host would have to pass it in, but you can pass the device in and then you can use it in. It'll be owned by your namespace then. So you can do that. Yes? 
I think he did that manually. Okay. Um, the two million, or, 21 million. Yeah, I, I set that up automatically. Ad user sets up on, on Ubuntu, ad user adds 65,000 of them per user, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you do. So you, there is a default. Um, but since I want to do two different containers and not deal with uh, cutting up the ID map, I just gave them a million instead of 65,000. Okay. But the, the, the point is you're not having to manually manage that yourself, like keep track of the, the um, ID spaces. It depends on how flexible you need to be. Like right. by, you can use the defaults. But he, he manually allocated them because he wanted more than the default allocations. Right. In, in, so. in uh, Nova Compute Flex and that, the idea was what we were planning on doing there is in order was just to give that user, to give that user that's running Nova Compute Flex all of that range, and then, when it, and then it would cut containers into it. But he has basically the entire range, and then he manages the sub, the, the cut ups. Um, not to my knowledge. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it's in to be able to put KDM into multiple containers. You can do that. You can already have isolation. What do you mean by isolation? No, oh, it's in you could. No, I think right. there are plans. Question? Um, do you want to answer that? It would take hardware help to get further. And I think hardware help is on the way. But right now... But is, yeah, and essentially with, with, uh, with containers and user namespaces, you can feel if you would give someone an unprivileged user shell access, then you can give them an unprivileged container access. It, it, it's that level of, of uh, security. There. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's through C groups. Yeah, through C groups you can set memory limits. So let's see. In the I, libvirt, the the Nova Compute libvirt driver does this, and so does the Nova Compute Flex. Um, yeah. So your instance type size will be two gigabytes of memory, and they get two big two gig of memory. Um, I think that LXC uses AppArmor. You can both. Both are integrated. Um, so we in Ubuntu, AppArmor is, de is de installed by default. So we're, we're integrated with that with the policies in Ubuntu. Um, Oracle ships some S Linux stuff and is working on further refining that. So both work, um, and policies are available for both. Smack support is not yet there, um, but one day it might come. He did, he did. No, I didn't show nested. I thought NSC1 was nested. No. Yeah, you, but nesting does work. Inside the new namespaces, nesting does work. Um, since Anna C2 was given that entire range of 100,000 UIDs, she could have created as many containers as she wanted underneath there and split that range up. Um, first. And that, that would basically seem from the parent range in the UID, GID, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from, and, but, and then outside, uh, Outside, you'd probably be able to figure out the topology. There aren't a lot of good tools that will just display that for you. Like, but um, yeah, actually, I was impressed. PS has PS is able to show the the file I know number, and that was very useful. And it shows it can do that for all of the namespace kernel features. So it's kind of nice. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.